Hello everyone, thank you for coming to present your productions to me today. Um, sadly, we will only be able to fund one of your productions. Um, I love, I'm so happy to be here. I'm so excited to hear your storyboards today. Uh, we're going to start with Elena, because uh, ladies first, so Elena, take it away. Hello, my name is Elena Green and I'm here with my submission for a short movie pitch on the, on the educational children's video of the history of acting. Hey kids, today we will be learning about the history of acting. One can't discuss the history of acting without talking about the cult of, Dia cult of Dionysus. Now the cult of Dionysus was a group of people that were seen as outcasts from Greek society that came together and celebrated Dionysus in the form of wine, frivolity, and just really partying. And one of the rituals that this cult performed was the procession from Euthyria to Athens, where they did chants and sang songs along the way that they called, and that we know them as, as dithyrams. Now, one person during this procession would come out of the group and do the actions and perform the verses of the play as if they were the characters. And this man was named Thespis. And he is the first actor in recorded history and the one credited for the use of masks in order to switch characters super quickly in Greek theater. Now this art form stayed kind of within itself until a tyrant named Presbystratos came to power over Athens. Now he wanted to find a way to unite all the people that he just conquered and glorify Athens. So he came up with making a festival called the Pantheatric Festival and adding dithyram contests in it where different troops would perform different romantic tragedies and comedies at the time. Now the people that watched these were not only very entertained and saw this as a way of, of religious praise of whoever the festival was honoring, but they also saw it as their civic duty to learn as much of, from these plays as they could to learn of what a good person would do and what a good society looks like. Now this was all well and good until the Romans came and they conquered Greece and spread their art and theater everywhere. But they didn't keep the religious aspect of the art of acting into it. They saw it as another form of entertainment except they already had a lot of entertainment and they saw actors as lazy and they often associated actors with other professions and thus did not see them very highly. And, that, and as the Roman Empire grew, it became a monotheistic empire of Christianity and everyone was Christian and no one likes theater as a Christian, even more than the Romans hated them because not only was it seen as lazy and unethical, but it was also an unholy act to do as it encouraged people to do sin. So yeah, actors did not have it great back then. And the art form kind of almost died out with like really small performances of like mimes or uh, underground performances. And it didn't really come back until the 10th century BCE of the medieval era, where it was said that there was a little show put on during the Easter Sunday service, where Mary would come to the tomb and see that it was empty, and they would sing. A very short thing, and the whole performance in and of itself was kind of short. But it was enough to spark the interest of theater back up again. This added with the uh, writings of different new plays by none other than Nun Hrochteva really helps theater grow and actors become a little more popular back in this period. So much so that actors started to come together in groups and different actor troops will perform different scenes from the Old Testament as the acting went away from the pews of the church and out onto the streets. 
But during this time, there was some religious upheaval and a declaration that the clergymen and the members of the choir could no longer perform, thus making theater at this time turn from religious to secular. And this stayed for a little bit, and actors would travel from place to place until the Italian Renaissance came. And religion was kind of pushed to the side while other arts flourished, like philosophy, science, math, and art, and, well, theater. And especially in Italy, there was a new form of theater called Camilla dell'arte, where the actors would act as certain stock characters, and they would be put in different scenes and different situations to see how the story would develop. Now, as I said, the characters themselves were the same over and over and over again, but the situations and the character dynamics that came out of these really is what made them interesting. And the Renaissance finally made its way to England and Queen Elizabeth I, along with uh, theater, was kind of growing, but at this time also was religious dissent amongst um, the Protestants and the Christians. And thus she made two new proclamations that no religious or political play could be performed, which kind of killed a lot of the different plays that were done during the medieval era. And actors were officially varagrants or supposed criminals and could be fined from going town to town, which uh, <laughs> was kind of exactly how like theater worked at that time. So actors at this time were already seen in a kind of a negative light. And now the queen herself just said that there were a bunch of varagrants that could be acted like that under the law. There were a lot of groups that just straight up didn't like them. And a lot of guilds hated their guts because actors didn't work professionally like they did in the sense that you had to be an apprentice for 10 years and then you could actually start working at the firm and then you work your way out the ring. Acting didn't have that. So a lot of these different members from these guilds called them masterless and thus could frame them for crimes that they did not commit because it was way easier to blame the nasty, dirty old actor. To protect them from such persecution, the actors formed troops and guilds of their own and went after and sought patronage of the high lords and ladies of the land and would name their troop after them, like the Lord Chamberlain's men, Lord Admiral's men, or the King's men. So in this way, they could claim that they were not masterless, but in fact servants of these high lords and ladies that were funding them for these plays. Now, actors were still not seen barely highly, and there's many suspicions about an actor themselves, but the art of theater and plays became more and more popular, and people would go outside of the city because, again, theater inside, theater and acting inside of the city was outlawed. They would come to the building, which is one of the first one of the first instances of a permanent residence for actors and came to the theater to watch these different plays. And one famous playwright from this era is Shakespeare. Not only was he an actor, but he was a phenomenal playwright and a shareholder of the Globe Theater. What he did that changed actors was he wrote characters that stayed human throughout the entire thing. Most actors and playwrights would often perform a story where one character is that this is the villain and this is the hero, but he allowed humanity in all these characters, whether they were the hero or the villain, so you could understand that character and have the character question themselves, is this the right thing to do, is this the wrong thing to do, and kind of force the audience to ask, to ask those same questions themselves. And then Puritans came into power and they completely killed off theater with kind of the same reasons that uh, the early like Roman Christians hated them, but this time was like, boom, you're done. So that kind of sucked for a long time. And 
again, only survived on the fringe of society with these tiny performances and some underground place until the Renaissance made its way to France and French neoclassicism began, where they revived the era of art, of theater and acting, and not only revived some of the old plays from uh, Aristotle's and uh, Plato's time, but wrote their own plays as they performed it as more of a new form of art than just purely entertainment. Now, with this, there were a lot of rules and prose that were compacted into how to write these plays and how the characters should act and this and that. And as more people started to ask more and more questions like, well, what if we did this? Or what if that character didn't have to do that? And acting and theater evolved from there. And the rest is history. All the things that we see in modern acting are the evolution of acting as an art form. And now actors can uh, express new and difficult and convoluted emotions as realistically as they possibly can in whatever story that the mood calls for. So, to recap, the Greek actor wore masks and they performed for religious reasons and everybody loved them. Roman actors got rid of the masks, did a little more, little different costumes, and did it purely for entertainment, and a lot of people hated them. Medieval actors were usually clergymen or people of the choir, until they weren't, had simple costumes and did it for religious reasons, and there were still people in the aristocracy that didn't like them. And then you have the Italian Renaissance with the Camilla della Arte, where these actors really only performed comedy and did it for entertainment purposes on a lower scale. Now, there were still people of high power that didn't like them, but the art of acting became a little more fun. And then you have the actors of Shakespeare's era who were not respected by aristocrats, nobility, or peasants. Like a lot of people just didn't like them, but they loved the stories that they told. And actors themselves got to act in new and different ways than they could before. And then uh, the French with the French neoclassicism era brought in new reforms to this art form that was still entertainment, but mainly it was super cool art form. And people generally liked it again, just as much as they would like the next Picasso or painter. And then you have the modern era where any actor could be anyone or anything that any story could possibly call for. And most people, if not all people, generally, generally like actors and see them more as celebrities, if uh, famous enough. Thank you very much for watching this video. Until then, I bid you all adieu. Elena, thank you so much for your wonderful production storyboard. Um, now we're going to shift over to Shaylee. Shaylee, please take it away. Hey, classmates and fellow people. Um, my name is Shaylee Ray. I wanted to cover the different trainings of acting with regards to theater and how it, improve it improves acting and what it does for that. First off, we are going to cover what is training of acting. Just like anything we do in life, there needs to be practice if we are wanting to improve on the talent that we have. Acting is no different than wanting to learn how to play the piano and developing those skills. It takes time, work, dedication to become better and to improve those skills. With that, there is the vocal training of an actor. <clears throat> vocal training can help actors and non-actors by helping unlock each voice unique potential. It can help you in essence to find your voice so you can be heard and understood, which can contribute positively to a person's overall health. 
Vocal training can also expand the imagination. There are a few ways to use vocal training to unleash a, a different side of your creativity. One of the benefits of vocal training is learning to enhance your vocal range and versatility, which means you can market yourself for more diverse roles. Casting will have the opportunity to see the many different sides of your acting skills, and vocal training will help you stand out in a crowd, crowded audience. Not only with vocal training will you be able to enhance and progress in your acting career as an actor, um, but you are able to be able to enhance your vocals by projecting, or you can be soft with your voice. And there are different techniques to vocal training because you have to be able to um, project while also being soft, project while being loud, and there is those different ranges, especially in the theater performance. A voice. Why is the voice of an actor important? You must be heard by everyone in the audience. Lines contain crucial information about the plot and the characters. Audience will get angry and bored if, you, if they can't hear you. It conveys what kind of character you are playing. It conveys what your character thinks and feels about the events that are taking place. So having your voice and portraying your voice is really important with um, being able to feel those emotions. Movement training. Um, just like vocal training, movement training is very important um, to actors to know where they need to be on the stage and how and what to do with their bodies. Acting is an athletic event. To speak the lines of Shakespeare or to perform in a three-act farce requires physical dexterity, flexibility, strength, and st stamina. Movement training for actors encompasses a number of techniques and philosophies that help free actors to inhabit the physical life of the actor. There are many techniques to movement training. One of them is your act, your character that you could be playing could be dancing. And you would have to figure out the techniques of that movement and figure out those steps. How your body should be moving if it needs to be with sharp um, movements. Or if it's supposed to be soft and flowy towards like being able to express how your character would feel in that um, scene or in that part in that play, to being able to express yourself through your body language. And last, acting is a sport. On stage, you must be ready to move like a tennis player on his toes. Your concentration must be keen. Your reflexes sharp. Your body and mind are on top gear. The chase is on. Acting in, is energy. In the theater, people pay to see energy. And with that, we are able to see what actors can improve on. And with being able to understand how the actors feel is through their voice and through their actions. Back to you, Jared. Shaylee, good job. You did fantastic on your storyboard. Um, now we're going to go over to Brayden. Brayden, take it away. Hi, my name is Brayden Flint, a playwright and a director of theater, and today I'm here to present my storyboard for a gripping historical fiction play production, and that which teaches the decentralization and subsidization of theater starting in the 1940s during World War II until the 1980s, and its effect on modern theater. Although its main protagonist, Jacob Mackey, is a fictional character, all of the dates, events, and secondary characters are factual. Also, he will be an accurate representation of the influences that brought decentralization and subsidization to the industry. My production is called Subsidized, A Journey of a Producer, and I hope that today I can win the grant for my production. As I mentioned earlier, my production is a historical fiction that follows the story of a young, small-town Nebraskan native with no family named Jacob Mackey, who aspires to be a theatrical producer who joins the American war effort during war World War II. 
The first act will start in 1944 in Normandy, France, where he's stationed when one month after over Operation Overlord, a United States Organizations Inc. or USO camp show performs the Barrettes of Wimpole Street, where he is stationed. These camp shows were privately funded by donations and grants and were the small beginnings of subsidizations. These productions were a miracle given the state of society and despite the large, largely disrupted activity in theater due to the war. The emotional impact of this tired and worn soldier, the emotional impact that this camp show, that this performance had, excuse me, on this tired and worn soldier only further inspired his interest in producing plays. Being business minded, he begins brainstorming ways in which he can bring play productions to even more people, even in small towns or in remote desolate places or in areas with little financial resources. The final act of scene of act one, um, final scene of act one will show a celebration of the end of the war in 1945 and Jacob Mackey traveling to London rather than a home to Nebraska where he has no family. He begins working for a small theater company to learn the ropes. The beginning of scene two will depict the changes influenced by a government funded performances that happened during World War II to build morale, something that Jacob has a testimony of. That funding after the war was continued in Europe. This story will follow Jacob Mackey in his quest to bring the theater to poor towns in England. Decentralization puts production of plays in the hands of local producers and is accomplished through financial assistance in the form of subsidization, which means that the government funded a portion of um, the cost necessary for the production, which made it so that the production was not only possible, but could also bring the prices down of its tickets and therefore making it more accessible to more people. Next, we'll show Parliament, which authorized local authorities in England to, to devote a percentage of their tax revenues to the arts in 1948 and in the formation of the Arts Council of Great Britain, which in my production, Jacob will play a significant role in so that we can teach this, um, this important part of the industry to those who watch the production. Following this, Jacob will join the Stratford Festival in a Stratford upon Avon in England, a provincial theater festival, and his business knack will become expertise and he'll help it to gain traction. And in 1960, Jacob Mackey will move home to the US. He and the RSC and the National Theater seek ways to expand the traditional audience face to have educational facilities and they bring productions to high school and college age students. Act three will begin with the opening scene of Mackey in 1961 in his new home after he's moved to Minneapolis. He reads a newspaper article in this opening scene about um, news in the theater, where he learns that the name of his beloved Stratford Festival has been changed to the Royal Shakespeare Company is, and is making huge strides with subsidization. In other news, the federal theater stopped being sub subsidized by the government in the United States, the, by the United States government in 1939, but there's stirrings among American art groups that America should adopt similar principles. So our protagonist will take this as a call to action and will go on a search for people to help him bring his vision to his nation of origin. This is where he meets Tyrone Guthrie of Guthrie Theater in Minneapolis. At the time, he was one of the world's foremost directors. Um, the play will end with him shaking hands with Tyrone Guthrie in a coffee shop, which will be which will serve as a foreshadowing of the reawakening of decentralization in America during in 1963. Um, why should my production um, receive the grant? That's bec um, because first it celebrates subsidization. Um, which your contribution is a modern example of and will further the cause of boosting morale among the masses and making theater more available to um, everybody. Further, it's educational and teaches the history of decentralization and subsidization that will build the foundation that this production will stand on, which is poetic and intriguing. It's not only a gripping story, but it is also one an important one that ought to be told. Thank you for your time. 
All right, Brayden, I loved your production storyboard. I loved all you guys' production storyboards. Now we have our last contestant, all right? Um, his name also so happens to be Jared. I don't know. He also kind of sounds like me. Who knows? Anyways, Jared, your turn. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity to present uh, my potential production to you. Very excited about it. I've titled it The Revolution of Methods of Theater. And as you can see, there's a government sign with a big X. That means that the government will certainly have less control, also known as the decentralization of theater. Now, this brought a lot of changes to theater. As a result, there was less funding and control given by the government and also churches. Uh, that meant more funding and control was required by corporations and private sponsors. Also, they relied more on charities and ticket sales for money. Thus, the subsidations of funds and control changed. Now, flexible space also increased over the years because of the ability to be less censored and controlled by the government. Now, more smaller theaters emerged and many theaters that lacked a lot of funding emerged as well. Thus, improvisation and less expensive sets were required and flexible space was used more and more. Uh, so now, quote, the concept of a building designed for flexible staging techniques can be attributed to Swiss designer Adolphe Appia. And this is a picture from, uh, and that's a quote from 1921, and this is a picture from on the right. Nice to put a name to the face. Now, there are many people who use flexible space well, and a great example of this and the star of this production is Jerzy Kratowski. He is the founder of what is called Poor Theater. Now, he loved to bring the audience and the actors physically closer together, thus creating a more interactive performance. Now, Krotowski coined the term poor theater, defining a performance style that rid itself of the excesses of theater, such as lavish costumes and detailed sets, hence poor. Uh, poor theater pieces center on the actor's skill and are often performed with only a handful of props. Now, as a director, Krotowski preferred to perform works in non-traditional spaces, such as buildings and rooms, instead of mainstream theater houses with traditional stages. Typically, the audience was placed on many sides of the action or in and amongst the action itself. Uh, for example, sort of traveling around the room together. Um, they could go and interact with the props. It was cool. It was great. Now, here's a quote from Krotowski that I like. Young artists wish for inspired moments. And you find them. You take them. Eager artists are like bandits. Theatrical moments arrive and you grab. Good. You know it will draw attention to you, but you aim to be more than bandits, no? So okay, now be samurai. Now, Jerzy Kratowski, he pushed his actors and actresses to become more physically and mentally. He wanted to change them, uh, make make their skill levels better, and rely on less they like less on sets, less on fancy costumes. Um, wouldn't even allow for costume changes. If you had to go to a wedding, you were wearing the same costume you started out in. So he really pushed people to um, make their acting better. Now, poor theater is merely one example of how barriers were being broke down and people were being more able to express themselves and create productions with no expensive or extensive scripts and productions. Now, this is what I wanna base my play around is Kratowski and how he changed theater and how he used what little he had to create an interactive play experience. I want to show the changes that were happening in society around him and how it affected him. I want to see Kratowski change the actors and actresses around him, not only physically, but mentally too. I want to show him making plays such as Cordy and The Constant Prince, etc. I want to see the changes happening in the audience and I want to show Kratowski's impact on the viewers of his show. I want to show the world the depth of what can be accomplished if flexible space is used properly and that we can do so much even if we have so little. Now, these are just my references for convenience sake. And it's also for the consideration for the dramaturg to research and determine the play's accuracy of that time and hopefully can add it so that the play can be made as accurately as possible. Thank you so much for your time and consideration and have a great day. Thank you, Jerry. You did a great job on your storyboard, and so did everybody. Thank you. I loved your presentation so much. Now, after careful consideration, the production that we are going to invest in is...